where the city was built. Now you got to remember, Nazareth was built in a mountain, it was a hilly area. So they brought Jesus at the edge of a cliff, right? They said, yeah, you, you, you're the son of God, you're the Messiah we've been waiting on. So their intentions was to take him, the son of God, the one that's come to die for their sins, the one that's given them breath in their lungs, the one that loves them with an everlasting love. Their whole intentions at that time was to take him and cast him down the cliff so that he can bust his head. What kind of people is that? So the Bible says in Mark chapter 6, verses 1, it says, And he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day, had, day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence had this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him that even such mighty works are wrought by his hand? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon? Are not his sisters here among us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto him, a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin, in his own house. And he could do no mighty works, save that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of the unbelief, and he went round about the villages teaching. So, by way of recap, if y'all remember, man, we again, we looked at the verse 1, and verse, the first part of verse 1, it says, and he went out from thence, and we look back to see what was this thence that, uh, that Mark was uh, referring to when he came to the life of Jesus. So, we went through uh, Mark chapter 1, all the way to verse 5, and we saw that uh, Jesus, man, he got baptized in the Sea of Galilee. Not only did he get baptized in the Sea of Galilee, he began to call his 12 disciples, man, he went out into the wilderness where he was tempted for 40 days, man, he did all kind of stuff. After that, man, he's full of power and anointing, man, and he, he goes out there and he be, starts to be, uh, perform all kind of miracles. He goes in the synagogue, man, he, he heals a, a leopard man. And remember Jairus' daughter, man, she was sick. She ended up uh, even dying, man. He went there, he healed her, raised her from the dead. Peter's mother-in-law was sick, man. He touched her and bomb, she got up. Uh, also, the lady with the issue of blood, man, she was, had, had been bleeding for a very long time, and she touched the hem of Jesus' garment, and she was made whole. All right? So that was the thence. So now we get to the part, uh, the second part of verse 1, and it says, And he came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. If I had to title this message tonight, or this Bible study tonight, the title would be, There's No Place Like Home. All right? There's no place like home. And the Bible says again in verse 1, and he came into his own country. Now, when I think about country, I always think about it as a little town or a little city. Now, again, where was Jesus from? Nazareth, all right, all right. And where, most of the, where was the most part of his ministry that he was doing all the ministry work? Where, what part of the country was he in? Not almost. No, no, you was close. You was close. Galilee. Galilee. I know you wanted to say Galilee, and you was going to say, and then, then Capernaum, you know. You was close. Dave. No, you was close. Okay, so, now, Nazareth itself is, is about, from the Sea of Galilee, um, soundboard, I know I didn't, I didn't send it to you this week. Do we happen to have that little map? We don't have to have it, but if you can, you can pull it up. Galilee is, uh, I mean, Nazareth is a little town uh, probably about 20 to 25 miles southwest of the Sea of Galilee. All right? Now, remember, Sea of Galilee, you know, all, all kind of stuff was going on over there. But Jesus and his disciples, man, they headed back home towards Nazareth. So, man, they get over there. All right, so, yeah. All right, so we got the Sea of Galilee here, right? Y'all can see that? So about southwest would be Nazareth. Now, that little bit of square that's on the screen, that's about how big Nazareth was. Some say Nazareth was about 60 acres, the whole city, the whole town. 60 acres, man, that's, that's pretty small, man. Population probably was pushing about 400, 500 people. Kind of like Preron. I mean, not Preron, uh, Freelo Cove or Lartel. You know, this, well, no, Lartel probably got more than 60 acres. But this is the thing. It was a little small, small town that Jesus 
was from. And, and I know that while he was doing his, his, uh, his, his ministry and while he was going out there healing the sick, raising the dead, all this stuff, all he can think about was going back home. And we get to this point where he has come down this dusty road headed south and he gets to Nazareth. I want you to imagine it's Jesus and his disciples, right? Now, at this time, we don't know how many disciples there is. It could have been just the 12, or it could have been all the followers of Jesus, because you remember when he was doing all these miracles and stuff, man, all kind of people wanted to be around him, all kind of people wanted to be. So, man, Jesus left Nazareth, you know, a while back, and then now he comes here, and he might have 120 people. He almost carrying as many people in the city with him now. And he's coming up to his hometown. And man, I don't know, when I was just reading the story, I could just picture, you know, him, him walking up and you could see the big sign saying, welcome to Nazareth. Or a piece of cardboard saying, welcome to Nazareth. I don't know what he had, but Nazareth wasn't all that. The only good thing that came from Nazareth, the only thing Nazareth knew for us, that's where Jesus was raised. Right? Nothing else. They didn't have no Buddha festival. They didn't have no shrimp festival, no okra festival. They had nothing. No Yambali parade or nothing. It was just Nazareth. All right? So, man, he comes back. And the Bible says, and he came into his own country, him and his disciples. Now, I got to thinking, like, you know, when, when you first left home, right? And, you know, you were young, and you went wherever you came, and wherever you went. And it was time for you to come back home for the first time after you've been gone. Or maybe you met your little boo, and, you know, you want to show her where, you know, where you grew up and all that stuff. I wonder if Jesus was thinking about that when he was on his way to Nazareth with his disciples and stuff. He was like, man, I'm going to show you all, man, where I grew up. You know, I, man, where I remember the little house where, where my, my daddy was running his business. It used to be just a little small little shop in the back for J&J &J Builders, right? Because they had this company because Jesus was a carpenter. They were builders. Joseph was his daddy, G, J, and J, Joseph and Jesus, for those of you who didn't catch it. But they ran this major uh, operation out of Nazareth, right? So he's going to go and show them this is with the little house that we started in, but this is where we moved up to. And, man, this is where we used to shoot well, I don't know if they were shooting basketball or maybe they were throwing rocks or something inside of a. But the thing was, was Jesus on his way back, were he trying to entertain his partners and stuff? Because, I mean, we call them disciples, but that was really like his, his boys. You know what I'm saying? That was like his, his crew. I remember when he uh, first brought Misha home. Uh-huh. Oh, you don't want to tell me? Okay, I, God, let me tell you business. You guys going to be all right. Remember the first time I brought Misha home, and you know, I wanted to show you where I show her where I grew up, you know. And I'm like, man, this is Opelousas right here. We have the best fried chicken in all the world at Mama's, you know. So brought over there, and I showed her this big pasture where we used to play football and baseball at. And I, I said, man, look, that's the pasture where we used to play in. And she was like, I don't see no pasture. I'm like, girl, that right there. She said, Phil, that's just an abandoned lot where they told the old house. Down. Well, at the time, it seemed so big, right? And, man, we had top of the line, uh, uh, you know, uh, sporting equipment. Man, we had a good mop stick and a tennis ball that we would use to play. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm just reminiscing when we, you know, I went back home, right? And then if you wanted to actually play baseball, you know, you had to, you usually had a lot of bases around. Those bases would consist of, you know, that paper bag that Mr. Cleave had been drinking his beer that he just threw down. So you take that paper bag that'd be first, you take his beer can, and you make that would be second. So, you know, we, we, I'm thinking it was Jesus reminiscing about when he came into town, man, after he'd done all these miracles, what we, you know, when he would see one of his childhood friends, he'd be like, man, look, look, T-Pop, man, T-Pop, still in the hood, man, he's still here, you know. Because the thing about Jesus, when you think about it, they knew what was going on with him in that, right? Jesus was doing all kinds of miracles, and he knew. So, so my thing was, was, when Jesus came back, was he excited? Was the, the anticipation of seeing everybody being back home, was that something that was, was really building up? And I'm, I'm just thinking, because, you know, when you come home, you know, home is supposed to be a place of, of love and a place of just people embracing you and my thing was Jesus thinking about that when he came back to Nazareth. 
I remember while Jesus was out there going, man, he was, he was preaching, he was teaching, he was evangelizing, he was a missionary. So when I put all those words together, I came up with this new word that Jesus was doing, right? And he was called a preteacher venary. That's when you just put preacher, teacher, uh, you know, evangelist, all that together. That's what he was, right? And I'm wondering, man, as, as the excitement, because I know somebody didn't heard that Jesus was coming back to town. Did they, did they put up billboards, man, in the city of Nazareth saying, man, welcome home, Jesus? Like, you know, did they have that? Was the atmosphere set or was, you know, somebody went and printed up all kind of flyers saying, man, look, for one night only, man, Jesus is going to be on this Sabbath. He's going to be at the synagogue, man. You don't want to miss him, the, old, the big time preacher and teacher, Jesus. Hmm. Now we look at the verse 2. Jesus is here now. The Bible says in verse 2, it says, And when the Sabbath day was come, all this anticipation, all this buildup, all this is going on right now, and the day is finally here. Jesus is getting ready to deliver a message like no other, to his hometown. And I want you to just to kind of pay close attention, guys, because just like I named the title of this message, there's no place like home. We know that Easter is coming up, and a lot of you probably going to be going back home to your families. You're probably going to be spending time with them this week. So I just want you to keep this message in the back of your mind as we go through it, because this is the thing. It might not always be so great when you get back home, especially for your stand for Christ. So when I'm looking at this thing, I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to picture it. And of course, my mind works a little bit different than most. So I'm seeing things that probably is not always in the scripture, but it's not wrong. It might not just be right. You know what I'm saying? So the Bible says, and, on the, and when the Sabbath day was come, so the big day is here. Everything is set. The synagogue probably is packed with all 400 people well, not all 400, but all the people that really wanted to see Jesus, that knew Jesus when he grew up, that knew uh, Jesus when, when he was uh, just a baby. He was a little, you know, he came up and Mary and Joseph was doing their thing and, and Jesus was also doing his thing. And I was wondering, when Jesus was a baby, was he just doing stuff not just like a normal kid? Would he always, did he have some times when he used his supernatural help, right? Because he was all God and he was all man. Mary said, boy, get in there and clean your room. No problem, mom. Room a mess, isn't he? Angel of the Lord, get that room clean. And bam, he come back, room is clean. Or maybe James was picking on him, right? Saying his little brother was aggravating him or something, man. You know, so James, come walk with me on the Sea of Galilee. See if you can do that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> this is the thing, man. Did Jesus use his superpowers when he was? When he was young, and I'm just thinking, man, you know, the people out there, they're all here, and they're here to see Jesus. So Jesus walks into the synagogue, right? And I know the worship is going on, and they probably were singing, Yahweh, Yahweh. Because they weren't singing nothing about Jesus, because at the time, you know, he was still just Jesus. So they were singing Yahweh, or they was worshiping and all that stuff. And Jesus walks in there, you know, with his security. I'm mean, not his security, his disciples, you know. Well, I could say security because Peter probably was ready at all times. You know, Peter carried his sword at all times. So they walk in, you know, and it's about to go down. And I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, wow. Just imagine you going back and they find out, man, that you, you have gotten saved while you're away and you became a minister or you became to, you know, somebody that, that, that preaches or they know you for being a good believer, Right. And you come back home, and now everybody's kind of, wait a minute, what is he going to say? What is he going to do? I remember when I, was, uh, when I was at UL, and well, USL at the time, and God just pulled me out of that darkness, right, and out of that mess. And I wasn't doing no bad, bad stuff, but I was doing just enough to consider myself a good person. Well, when he called me, I remember, man, we were at this place. I was just fellowshipping, you know, at Grant Street. And uh, 
<laughs> well, I, love, I like the fellowship. I, I, at that time, I liked the fellowship. So I was there, and, and you know, and I'd already called myself and got right with God. But I was over there in the club, and you know, I wasn't supposed to be in the club. But I remember that night, man, and I remember Lil Wayne and they was getting ready to come on stage, and you know, so I, I forgot how much I paid to get in, but at the time, man, I just felt so disgusted of being in this place. And so I dapped my partners up, and I said, man, it's not for me no more. And them boys was like, man, look, bro, you're tripping. You already paid $40, $50 to get in there. Why don't you just change your life tomorrow? <laughs> I'm like, nah, bro, I'm out. So, man, some time it went on, and I remember this brother that was, you know, was real cool. His name was Moses, and he was from, like, the Dominican Republic, right? And I'm going to get back to the story, but at first I thought he was faking with his accent because he looked just like us, a regular, you know, brother, looked like a regular black dude, you know, boxing and everything, but he would talk with this accent, and I didn't know he was, I just thought the boy was, like, from Karen Crow or something. I didn't know where he was from. So, anyway, he saw me one time, and he was like, Man, be filled, they tell me she'll change your life, man. I said, what? He said, they tell me she'll change your life. And he was trying to say, I heard that you change your life. And it was, it was like, I said, yeah, man. I, I said, bro, I'm, I'm a believer now. You know? And he was just kind of like, all right, so what does that mean? And I'm like, bro, I, I changed my life. That's it. I'm out. I, I, you know, I wasn't about sharing the gospel too much at the time, but... The thing is, a lot of times people are going to remember you from your old days, and when they find out something new has happened, they're going to be curious about the change, and that's going to be your opportunity to tell them about the change. And the Bible says, and when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. Now, let's stop right there. Now, when you look at the account in Mark, he doesn't tell you exactly what Jesus taught about. And I can think that Jesus was up there, and it was just like, I'm home now. I can see him, man, standing at the pulpit. He's touching, and he, he looks out, man, and he sees Mary, his mom. And he's like, Mom, I'm home, you know? He looks out, and he sees his brother James and Joseph and, and Simon and Jude. He sees his sister and him in the back, and he's just kind of like, hey, how y'all doing? You know, I'm here. And he's getting ready to start to bring a word. He's seeing all the people that he grew up with. And all kind of memories begin to go through his mind. And then, you know, he's like, man, I'm home. And then one memory comes to mind. The last time he preached in the synagogue in Nazareth. So if you look at Luke chapter 4, verses 16, I mean, yeah, Luke chapter 4, verses 16. This right here, Jesus is remembering, because this is the thing. He went to Nazareth twice. This is his second time going and preaching in Nazareth. Now, according to the scripture, I can't find no other time that he went there. So this is going to be his last sermon that he gets to speak to his, his, his community, his, his city, his, where his, his childhood uh, upbringing, the place where he was brought up, the people that he loved the most, the people that probably, probably knew him better than anybody else. This was his last opportunity to share what is, is, is the thing that can change their life forever. Right before he began to teach. I can imagine that he began to remember the last time he was here. And the Bible says in verse 16, and it came, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And his custom was that he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for it to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, or Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Now, this is the thing. They just handed him a scroll, right, the first time he was there. They handed him the book of Isaiah, and they said, man, go on and read this. And, and the way, I guess, the customs of, of the synagogue at the time, that they would go in there, they would get uh, one of the prophets, the writings of the prophets, they would read the prophets, and then after that, some, they, they would go on and expound on it, right? So when Jesus opened up the scroll, he opened up, really, I think that's Isaiah 60, I think, verse 1, but uh, the Bible says in verse 18, and this is what was written, the Spirit of the Lord 
is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He had sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering sight unto the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, now this is the thing. Jesus gets up there, right, and he goes and begins to read this very chapter in Isaiah. And now all of Nazareth, all of the synagogue is looking to him. The religious leaders are there. They're watching him. All his mom and all of them, they're probably there too. Or either that is that might be the time when they was trying to call him and tell him, Jesus, man, look, your mom and your daddy, I mean, your mom and your brother and my side. You're going too far with all this stuff, Right? So he's, he's, he's reading Isaiah. Now, the thing is this here. Those people that were in the synagogue, they were familiar with that particular verse. Because for, for generations and generations, they have been looking for the Messiah, the king, to come and reign and take over. So, uh, they've been waiting for their king to come and to reign, right? So they knew the scripture that, that Isaiah was writing off. They probably went over it, I don't know, two or three times, you know, already. They were very, very familiar. So they knew what it said. Verse 19, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And verse 20 says, and he closed the book, or he dropped the mic, and he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fasted on him. Now, so far, so good. He got the attention. He he he, 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 he didn't open up to the book of Isaiah. Now he's getting ready to expound on that thing. And their hearts are wide open, ready to receive what happens next. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and he sat down. And the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day, on this day, Nazareth, listen to me. On this day, the scripture is fulfilled in your ears. The crowd should have went crazy. Man, the Messiah that we have been waiting on is finally here. He's finally been revealed. Man, look, it is awesome. And Jesus is listening, and all of a sudden, he just hears crickets. Nobody's saying nothing. Have you ever been somewhere, man, you, you, you say something or, or you, you do something that you thought was just, you know, phenomenal, and the person that's sitting across from you, they don't really say anything? It makes the moment, like, real awkward. You know, like, did you hear what I just said? No, I, I, no, I want you, I want to make sure that you heard. Look, the, he says this here, and, 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 and hi, let me see where he at. Uh, and, he closed the book. and he began to say to them, this day the scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Now, look and listen to the people. Look at the people. And all bear him witness and wondered at, grace, at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? Now, now, now remember, 100% God, 100% man just came to his very own city, his very own hometown, and let them know, listen, guys, the Messiah that you have been looking for, I'm here. Guys, the one that has done all the miracles and stuff, hey, that's me, it's Jesus, I'm here. Nobody bowed down in reverence to him. Nobody took their crown off and cast it at his feet. All they could say is, that's Joseph's son. Is that Joseph's son? I want you to think about, I don't know how good are you guys are at sharing, are at sharing the gospel, right? But have you ever talked with a family member or you gave the gospel to a family member and it was just like they just blew you off, like they didn't receive it or like you said something that was so crazy that they was like, well, ain't you Patsy's son? Oh, ain't you, ain't you little Lynn's son? Well, get out of here with that. All right, what time are we going up? Nah. This is the thing. When, when, when Jesus, re- uh, actually God allowed him to reveal who he really was, Jesus didn't get a, really offended by that. Because he understood that, look, I am their savior. The very thing that they need, I have. 
And I want that to be the same way with you. Whenever you go or maybe you're sharing the gospel with somebody or you, you out there and you pouring out your heart to them or you're giving them your testimony, man, don't worry about how they receive it. Just go on and give it to them because you have the very thing that they need. So their response was, is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, you will surely say unto me this proverb. Wait, say unto me this proverb, physician, heal thyself. Man, look, you, 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 you the Savior, man, save yourself. You know, just, just, you know. And, and, and I think about not only when, when he was in this situation, but do you remember when they had brought him in and he was getting ready to crucify him and they was hitting him and he said, man, prophesy who hit you. You know, you could tell this was some, some Hebrews. Because it's so hard for us to receive truth. We, we listen and we hear all kind of things and we take that stuff to heart. But when it comes to the gospel truth or the actual truth itself, it's like, man, we dispel it. And he said unto them, ye surely say unto me this, this proverb, physicians heal thyself. Whatsoever we heard done in Capernaum, do also in thy country. So what he's done, now they're kind of making fun of him. They say, all right, so you done all that stuff in Capernaum? You done all that stuff in Galilee? Okay, do something right now so we can believe. Now they know the scripture when it says a virgin shall give birth to a child. Now they know Mary, Mary and Joseph they hadn't hooked up yet. I think that's why they were saying, is that Joseph's son? Yeah, Joseph is not the father. Right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> he say, do also here in thy country. And Jesus said, verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you the truth, many widows were in Israel during the time of Elias or Elijah, when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months, with great famine was throughout the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto uh, Serapita a sitting unto the woman that was a widow. And y'all know the one when it was in the drought and um, uh, Elijah came to her and he says, man, look, make me a cake. And she's like, man, I ain't got no, all I got is a little bit of oil and a little bit of flour. Me and my son going to eat that and we're going to die. But the prophet came to her and she hearkened unto the words of the prophet and all of a sudden the food never ran out. And Jesus is reminding them, listen, man, you remember that that time they had a bunch of them, had a bunch of widows in, 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 in uh, Jerusalem or in Israel at the time. But guess what? Only this woman was saved because the rest of them really wouldn't receive. He also gave them another example. And he says, uh, um, and many lepers were in Israel in the time of uh, Elias, uh, that's El Elisha the prophet, and none of them were cleansed except Naaman. Remember we told Naaman, man, go wash three times in the Jordan River. They had a lot of people that was left with, but uh, uh, Naaman was willing to go through and listen to the voice of the prophet or listen to the voice of God. Verse 28 says, and they in the synagogue, when they heard this, were filled with wrath. Now this is the thing. This is your home, boy. This is the one that you grew up with. Why would you be filled with wrath? Now, wrath is different than just being mad and angry. Wrath is like, boy, I'm telling you, if I put my hands on you, I'm taking you out. I'm, I, I, I would do you something bad. I'm trying to hurt you. And you know, sometimes it could be like that. When we don't believe in something or we don't believe, we, we have a tendency to get mad at it. But listen to what his family, his friends, the people he grew up with, listen to what their response was or what, what the plan of action was. Now remember, Jesus is home for the first time. And not only were they filled with wrath, verse 29 says, and rose up and thrust him out of the city. They put in their hand on the man of God. Well, they put in their hand on God. And they pushing him and throwing him out of the city and led him unto the brow of a hill where the city was built. Now, you got to remember, Nazareth was built in a mountain. It was a hilly area. So they brought Jesus at the edge of a cliff, right? They say, yeah, you, you, you the son of God. You the Messiah we've been waiting on. So their intentions was to take him, the son of God, the one that's come to die for their sins, the one that's given them breath in their lungs, the one that loves them with an everlasting love. Their whole intentions at that time was to take him and cast him down the cliff so that he can bust his head. What kind of people is that? 
We can't be too hard on Nazareth. Because think about the times when somebody shared the gospel with you. Somebody told you that Jesus loves you. Somebody told you that you are in need of a savior. What was your response to them the first time? What was your response to them the second time? So I just want to let you know that when you're dealing with your family and your friends, man, don't don't be super hard on them when they just don't accept the gospel all at one time. When you share Jesus with them, just remember uh, uh, Romans 1 16. It says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the, the, because of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. That message in the gospel is the thing that have power. So listen, all you have to do is be the messenger. And they rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him into the bow of a hill whereon the city was built that they might cast him down headlong. They were about to bust. They were about to split Jesus' wig, literally. They were trying to split his wig. They was going, I'm talking about to the white meat. They was going to bust his head, right? But look at verse 30. Now, they all grabbing on him. They didn't thrust him out. They got him to the edge of the, of, of the cliff, and they about to throw him. And he just, and just walks away. Now they still there, thinking they're holding something and they realize they're holding on to nothing. How many of us, when we were in our sin, when we looked up and realized and came to the knowledge that Jesus loved us, we realized that we were holding on to nothing? Now that was the last time. He got up to teach in Nazareth. So here, he's back here again. Jesus, why would you come back? Them boys don't want you. They, 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 they truly don't like you over there. I would, well, I guess let's go to Capernaum again. Man, we have been to Capernaum 52 times. That's, that's all right. Let's, let's go back to Capernaum. Nah. Man, Jesus loved his people so much. He cared about them so much. He knew that, that, that he had one more chance to, to help them to get their hearts right. So when I'm looking at this verse of Scripture, he says in, 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 uh, in Mark chapter uh, 1, verses uh, 2, it says, oh, what did it say? I forgot what it say. Oh, it shucks. Here we go. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. So what did Jesus teach? Well, I begin to look through the Gospels and look through um, the messages. And Jesus pretty much preached the whole time, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So when I look at him standing before the people and he remembered, man, what had happened the last time he was here, I really believe that he preached that verse from Mark, Matthew chapter 4, verses 17. Now, Matthew chapter 4, verses 17 says this here. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, if you remember, John the Baptist went before Jesus, and that's what John was doing. John was preaching, repent for the kingdom of is at hand. But this is the thing that happened. John was Jesus' cousin, right, his big cousin, and he got arrested. So Jesus now, again, began to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So now Jesus is standing before all his family, all his friends, and he's looking them in the eye, looking them in the face. And I just could imagine him going into depth and telling them, look, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, what does the word repent mean? We always say repent means to turn away or turn in a new direction. I was looking the things up and it says the word repentance is in the Bible literally means the act of changing one's mind. All right. True biblical repentance goes beyond remorse, regret or feeling bad about one's sin. It involves more than merely turning from sin. Repentance is very important in the life of the believer. And I just want to tell you this here, man, brothers and sisters that are here. It is so important that when we, when we talk about repentance, we need to make sure that we're not uh, uh, holding on to some, some things or some past sins that, that God was, we were supposed to get rid of and let go. And we're really supposed to turn away from those things. And I'm going to be going, where I'm going with this is about us sharing the gospel. 
A lot, again, a lot of us are going to be going home. We're going to be spending time with our family and friends. And maybe the last time you were there didn't go too good, but God has given you another opportunity. And guess what? You're going to need to share the gospel with them. But not only do you share the gospel with them, you're going to have to make sure that you yourself has been repented. You have repented and you're living a life that's not in no open sense. So that way, when you go to deliver, God himself is going to use you and speak through you to connect with your family and friends. Amen. In the Old Testament, repentance or whole was uh, in the Old Testament, repentance or wholehearted turning to God is a recurring theme in the message of the prophets. Repentance was demonstrated through rituals such as they would fast. You hear about them fast in the Old Testament. You you hear about them wearing sackcloth and uh, sackcloth. They would they would put ashes on themselves just to to show man that they're really uh, they were truly sorry uh, for what they'd done. Um, not only would they do that, they would begin to wail and to cry and all this stuff. But it got to a point that some of them just kind of like, and I'm gonna just go through the motions. I'm really not sorry. You know, I'm only sorry because I got caught. And man, we don't want that to be us. I remember, man, we, before, I was, uh, before I was married, uh, it was, it was uh, certain things that, uh, that I kept asking God to forgive me for, right? And I was asking God to forgive me for those things because I didn't want to miss the rapture, right? I'm, 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 I'm kind of saved kind of sort I'm trying, but I'm really not trying that hard, but I just want to make sure, you know, I don't want to miss the rapture. I remember I used to be home, man, with me and my roommate, and if I would wake up in the morning and it was dark, I said, man, let me hear him call my mom. <laughs> hey, oh, I, I'll just call and see if the rapture hadn't happened, you know, because I couldn't go to my roommate, I know he was going to still be here. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I did, you know, so I had to call mom, you know what I'm saying, just to make sure. And, you know, and she would just sell me these, these words of encouragement. You know, she would just say on the phone, boy, that's sad. Boy, you're sad. <laughs> no, no, she, would, she wouldn't say that. But this is the thing. I remember, man, listening to, and, and at that time, I got rid of all my secular music, except for that Usher, but everything else I got rid of. <laughs> and I was listening to this Christian rap song, and, and the artist's name was Lil Rascal. Now, I got to remember, like, this is like 97, you know, so the Christian hip hop been around for a long time. So, you know, I had my little, you know, 112 in my car, you know, with the little band pass box. So I had that little knock up in there, you know. But I remember, man, part of the song came on and it's like all the bass and the trouble. I mean, all the bass just came out of the song and it says, sometimes we as Christians, we get stuck in the repent mode. How many times can you truly be sorry for the same sin? And y'all, I'm telling y'all, at that point right there, I'm like, oh, man. It was like a punch in the stomach, knocked the wind out of me. I said, God, okay, I'm, you know, I repented and I got right. And uh, needless to say, man, I've been married for 25 years ever since. So uh, <laughs> praise God for that. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> so... Some in the Old Testament were putting on sackcloth and ashes. And as much as I read that, I was like, man, somebody could open up a business. We sell just sackcloth outfits. You know how they got them, you know, them older brothers wearing them linen, you know, all linen. Out. Just imagine you got a whole a sackcloth suit on. Amen? But this is the thing. As we continue, it's not only are they talk about repentance in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament also. And I want you to be able, when you are uh, talking with probably family and friends and stuff, when you go back home or when you're with them, you know, you want to get them to the point that they're considering repenting of their sins, right? All right? And we're going to get to, you're going to, get to that a little bit uh, closer. So in the New Testament, uh, the New Testament begins with John the Baptist, again, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus saying the same thing. Both of them were urgently called, both urgently called people to repent because the arrival of the kingdom of God was at hand. Now, this is the thing. We say the kingdom of God is at hand, but do we truly know what that means? You ask the, you know, most people, or ask the Hebrew man, what, what is the kingdom of God? Well, you know, they're talking, uh, they talking about heaven. They're talking, they're talking about heaven. They're not really talking about heaven. When Jesus came and told the people to repent, 
for the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God was at hand. I went and I looked at that verse of scripture and I looked at the word kingdom and I looked at the word heaven. And I'm trying to figure out, man, why would it be such an urgency for them to repent at this particular point? When Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, this is what he meant by the kingdom of heaven. The word kingdom in the Greek is basilia, all right? And it means royal power, kingship, dominion, rule of royal power of Jesus as the triumphant Messiah, the royal power and dignity conferred on Christians in the Messiah's kingdom. So now I'm seeing that in the, when he says repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, they're talking about a, a real king, right? Okay, now that king has dominion. Matter of fact, that's where you get the word kingdom from. So you have kingdom and dominion and you put those words together, it's kingdom. When Jesus is telling the people to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, I think about Adam and the relationship that Jesus had when he created man in the first time in the garden where Adam could actually look at God and it was okay that he walked in the cool of the day and him and God had a conversation and then all of a sudden Eve comes along, she eats of the fruit, next thing you know sin enters the world and that thing, that dominion that Adam once had on the earth is lost. But here comes a second Adam to restore what the first Adam lost the kingdom, the dominion. So he says the kingdom of heaven. What is heaven? Uh, the Greek word for uh, uh, heaven is arananos. I'm probably saying that wrong, but just, just go with me. The region above the surreal heavens, the seat of order of things eternal and consummately perfect where God dwells and other heavenly beings. So when he say that the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand, he's saying that the opportunity for you to correct things back on the earth, in the earthly realm to get yourself right and to make sure that, that you have access to the heavenly realm is being restored to you. And that can only come through what? Through repentance. When I look at this thing, man, it's like, it's, it's, it's like God himself is sitting in heaven and we're all trying to get to heaven. But God told us to have dominion here on the earth. He told us to go, and, 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 and I, think it's in, um, I think it's Genesis chapter 2 or chapter 3. He says to, 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 to replenish the earth and really to take dominion of it. Guys, this is the thing. He's telling us that once we come to the understanding of who he is and we put our trust in him, we are to go out and do the very same things with our family and friends. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. We have now that, that man is no longer doomed to eternal death and hell and the grave. He now has an opportunity to tap into eternal salvation through the kingdom of heaven. And we are God's ambassadors to go out and do that. So the thing is, Jesus preached his family and friends. He taught them the gospel. He taught them that the kingdom of heaven is here. He wants to restore the relationship that Adam lost. Now we'll see probably next time that they didn't quite take it again. But I, question, I got a question for you. How many of y'all going home this weekend? How many of y'all going to be with y'all family? Them unsaved heathens, them ones that ain't right. Okay, right. That's my bad. That's just my fam, not y'all. This is the thing. I want to do something different tonight. We got a few more minutes left. I want to help you to make sure that you are conveying the gospel message the right way, right? So I need a few volunteers. Anybody want to volunteer? I need some saints and some sinners. I need at least about... Uh, Come on, yeah, don't, don't, don't be scared, guys, this, is, this, this Bible study is a small group. I need like, uh, let's say, uh, six people, six people right quick, six people. Anyway, come on up, Elijah, come on, come on up, man. We, this is the thing, we want to be able to uh, effectively convey the gospel message, right? So come on, come on, Dav, come on, uh, anybody else coming? Come on, Bryce, that's it, come on, my brother, this is the thing. And look, man, y'all can undo them barriers. If y'all run up here, I got something for y'all. <laughs> hey, worry, y'all can undo the barriers. Come, 
Come on up. Y'all can come on the stage. Come on up on the stage for me. That's it. So this is the thing. Jesus himself, when he went back home to, to Nazareth, man, he began to preach the gospel to his families and friends, right? Now, this is the thing. Bryce kind of know probably already know where I'm going. What's up, Bryce? How you doing? The, the chief evangelist of the church, Mr. Elijah. How you doing, sir? And what's your name, my brother? Leroy. Brother Leroy. All right. And my sister, how you doing? What's your name? Sylvia. Okay. <laughs> Why is that lightning down? No, I'm just kidding. Okay. So this is the thing. This is the thing. All right. Um, I need, okay, two of y'all stand right here and two of y'all stand right there. Just, okay, Daphne and um, Mr. Leroy. Y'all just kind of turn this way just a little bit for me like this right here. Just, you know, just come in this area. All right. No, okay, y'all say? Yeah, we say. Okay, y'all say, y'all say. And then, boy, I, I can tell by his goals he's not right. I can tell you're not right. So this is the thing, guys. Y'all will be at home, right, this weekend, probably eating them unclean scavengers, but they seasoned to a tea. And look, they, you know, you got that little bead of snot coming out your nose. Them crawfish is good. But this is the thing. Y'all up there talking, right? And the opportunity comes along. And they say, man, Mr. Leroy, this is your little nephew right here. That the one, remember your little nephew from on T mom's side? Now, that, yeah, little Elijah. Now, yeah, he's been, he been in a lot of trouble, but he's trying to get right. And, you know, he's he on parole right now, so he's, he's here. But the thing is this, Mr. Leroy. He always looked up to you. Uncle Leroy always had a good word, an encouraging word to him. But you never had a chance to share with him the gospel message, right? Now, Mr. Leroy, you got about five, no, three minutes. And then after that, somebody going to pull up on your nephew, and they're going to they kill him. So he got three minutes and you have an opportunity to share the gospel message or whatever you think is going to bear witness or bear record to him before he faces eternity. What would you say to him? Excuse me. Thank you. Mic check one, mic check one. All right, here you go. I would want to know uh, if he's saved, if he hasn't accepted the Lord as his personal Savior. Amen. Amen. And uh, it would be a blessing to him. And, uh, All right, I want, I want you to tell it to him. Don't, 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 you're not talking. Matter of fact, nobody sees. There's only about 10 of y'all at the house right now, and they just put the ball crawfish on the table. You just finished eating a piece of corn because you're not fooling with the crawfish. You're just eating the corn and the potatoes, right? So you're talking to him. Now go on and give it to him. Elijah, come on a little bit closer. Come on, because Uncle, uh, Uncle Leroy, I love you. All right. My brother, uh, I just wonder if you have accepted the Lord as your personal Savior, and uh, it'd be a blessing if you will. And uh, I'll do my best to uh, work with you. Amen? Amen. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, nephew, you know you've been wild or not. That man asked you if you accepted the Lord and said you did this. You said yes. Most of the time, that's how our family members will be. They always think that they're good enough to make it into heaven and God is not coming to them as a judge in the end. Right? So you tell them you hope that you would, would do it. All right? That was good. Now, Elijah, based on what Uncle Leroy just told you, mm -hmm. what are you going to do now? Well, in my, in my understanding, I think I would want to be able to give myself to God and basically do right and knowing that God is here to guide me in, in the right direction. All right, and, where you picked all that up? You was in, when you was in prison, where you, where you learned all that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, man, where, where you got all that from, man? I remember, because you've been wilding out the whole time. You got, you got, you got that drink in your car, you, but now you, well, praise God, you know, I really would like. Okay, no, that's good, that's good. All right, so, thank you all so much. Just stay right there. Let's go on to the next ones. All right, that's it, you got to talk to him. So now, again, this is not Friday, this is Sunday. So, so y'all, I'm sure just picked all them, them wicked Easter eggs and all that stuff. But they have just the thing. Elijah just made it in, but they coming for Bryce. They was going to get Elijah, but since Elijah got right, they was get coming for Bryce. And they're going to be here in about five more minutes. You got five minutes to share something with him that will change his life for eternity. I'm well, call your mama. <laughs> okay. okay. Get okay. it right. All right. No, no, that's, that's that. I am. <laughs> I call, I'm, but um, I would like to just, you know, say, man, get your life right. Because, you know, I promised him all. 
Jesus wept. He loved you. He died for you. All right. Good job. Love you enough for that. Yeah, okay. Okay. Now, hold on, hold on. No. Now, Bryce. Now, she just gave you that. What you going to do with that? What, what, what you, she even said Jesus wept and cried. Like, what you... No, just just make it easy for us. Like, you know, but you you still remember you wild and out. You're not you're not good, Bryce. You're Give not it to me the crop I can see Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I heard about Jesus before, you know, but I don't know if that's real or not. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, Miss Dad. Oh, listen, I'm gonna pray for you. That's all I got. That's it. Okay. <laughs> now look. What they done was not a bad thing, right? They, they shared with their hearts with, you know, what they thought was really a legitimate thing to say to actual sinner, right? Now, I myself have been kind of sharing the gospel for a little while. Now, I prefer when I share the gospel, I prefer to share it with somebody I don't know. But let's just say Bryce and Elijah, y'all both right there, y'all shooting dice, right? And I walk up there, I'm like, man, what's up, fellas? Y'all good? What's going on? All right, all right. Man, who winning? Who winning? I see y'all on your knees. What, 7-Eleven? Take me to heaven, huh? I see y'all doing a little dice. So, man, look, I want to holler at y'all just right quick, man. I'm not going to hold y'all too long. I see y'all having a good time with the family. Man, I got to ask y'all of this here. Now, now, you, I don't really know as much. I know you be coming around. And, Bryce, I just met you, you know, from, you know, you was about, you know, my, my wife, me, and them house that time. Man, look, man, y'all consider yourself to be some good people because y'all look like y'all some cool dudes. But I don't really know. So, man, you consider yourself to be a good person? I mean, yeah, of course. I mean, it's not a, it's not a problem because I've been, even though, e even though I'm shooting dice or whatever, and I, I'm still, I'm still a good person because I know that God is real for me. Okay, all right, cool deal. What about you, Bryce? You consider yourself to be a good person? Yeah, man, I walk a whole lead across the street. You know what man, I'm saying? So I think oh. I'm good. You hear me? That's what I'm talking about. Well, look, just the thing. I just want to ask y'all a few questions just to see how true it is. Time out. Now, when you're sharing the gospel with people, the Bible says that sin is the transgression or the breaking of God's law. When we're telling them to repent, we have to give them something that they need to repent from. All right? So, man, that's cool deal, man. So, look, bro, I'm going to just ask y'all a few questions just to see how true it is. All right? So, Elijah, Bryce, man, y'all say, man, y'all a good person. Let me ask you this here. How many lies have you told in your lifetime? Well, me, I, I don't know. See, my brother, just give me one, two, three, or four. How many lies have you told in your I lifetime? I told four lies. Before. Four lies? Okay, four. That's real. Bryce, how many? How many with, with you? And I've been lying all my life. All right, all right. So, <laughs> so, so this is the thing. <laughs> this is the thing. All right. So hold up, hold up. Now, now, now we all lied before. So, Elijah, you say you only lied four times, which, which that, you know, that y'all was a lie already. <laughs> But Bryce was truthful. <laughs> now, let me ask you this here. Man, what do you call a person that, that, that tells lies? It, 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 it rhymes with fire. Starts with an L. What do you call a person that tells lies? That, the liar. Somebody said it. All right. So look. All right. So now look. I don't know y'all, so I'm not trying to judge you at all. But by your own admission, man, you say you're a liar. Have you ever stolen something regardless of the value? Yeah, I didn't stole pulling this house. Okay, all right, all right. What about you, bro? Yeah, all right, so cool deal. So what do you call a person that steals things? A criminal. A criminal? No, I want to just, let's go with this. A thief, right? A thief. A, a thief. All right? So look, by your own admission, you're what? A sinner. No, by your, you, didn't, you, didn't, you, didn't, you didn't admit you was a sinner. You admit to being what, a thief? A thief. No, but you're a lying thief because you admit to lying and being a thief, right? So look, this is the one that used to get me. Jesus said, man, if you look at someone or look at a woman to lust after them, you committed adultery with them in your heart. Have you all ever looked with lust? Yeah, guilty. All yeah. right, all right. So that is the sin of adultery. Last one, and I'm telling you, bro, I'm going to let y'all get back to you all dice game because I see y'all fool getting cool. Now check this out. Have you ever got up in the middle of the night, man, you stump your toe, and the first thing come out your mouth is God, beep. Or you might have went up to somebody, sent something to you, you say, oh my. Yeah, I done, I done did that too. All right. Let me just tell you this here. That right there, it carries the weight of blasphemy because we're using God's name to express disgust or to express, express a cuss word. Now, listen, man, I sure appreciate y'all, you know, you know, hanging out with me just for a little bit. Let me ask you this here. If God was to judge you by the Ten Commandments, right, that was only four of them. 
who do you find you innocent or guilty? Guilty. Okay, guilty. All right. What about you? Guilty. Guilty as charged. Now let me ask you this here. You all know what God done for guilty sinners so they don't have, oh, no. My, my next question would be heaven or hell. Because that's the thing. You have to ask them heaven or hell because right now they're thinking about the stuff they've done. You said you'd be guilty. So now would you go to heaven or hell? Hell. Hell. All right. Now, most of the time, some of them going to say, yes, they're going to go to hell. And the others going to be like, nah, man, I, I'm not going to hell. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to go to hell. But then that, now you go back to the first commandment because they just created a God that's going to allow them to go unpunished and have their sins unpunished. Okay, so now you go to hell. Do you know what Christ done, God done for guilty sinners so you don't have to go to hell? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What, 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 what was that? Well, in my preference for, um, for all your... And he, Bryce, you can help him out if he gets stuck. Go ahead. He uh, basically... Die for, I think die for us or something like that. Okay, yeah. That, no, you, you are, you're on it. Because Jesus did die. But what good did it do? Because you think about it, man, people die every single day. You know they wasn't living right, but we always hear, man, Jesus died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross. Man, praise God. Jesus. What was the benefit to you for him dying on the cross? Um, he, he, done, he done crucified for me and knowing that even if I do wrong, mm -hmm. he'll, be able to forget, he'll be able to forgive me and... And knowing that whatever I done did in my past, I won't be able to. Time out. Now, remember, we talked about repentance, right? He just said that God was just going to forgive him, but he never said that he was ready to repent. And this is the thing, guys, when you're talking with your family and stuff, you don't have to be forcing nothing on them. You don't have to come with no super spiritual voice. Man, you're just talking to them and you're conversating with them. Why? Because you really love them. You really see that the position that they're in, you don't want them to continue in that thing. So Elijah, I would say this here. Well, you're not really Elijah. You eat. So this is the thing. Let me just tell you what the Jesus dying on the cross, why, is it, is it, why it's significant. What happened was God made the law. He gave us the law. We broke the law. Our punishment is sin. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So God made the law. We broke the law. Our punishment is death. So the reason Jesus came into play was to pay our fine. Him dying on the cross was a legal transaction. You ever been to court? Well, no, no mind. Don't say you've been to court. You got to go to court next week. Just think about this here. So you're going to be in court next week, right? And, and, and you stand before the judge, and I'm just breaking it down like this here. You're standing before the judge, and then you already admitted to the raping of the women. You got popped with 20 keys of cocaine, and you wild out on one day. And Judge Saloon and not going to play Judge Saloon, well, y'all, some of y'all know Judge Saloon like that. I'm not going <laughs> to say no name. But anyway, you're going to be standing before Judge Saloon, and look, Doug's going to look at you, and not Doug, Judge Saloon. He's going to say, but yeah, you, you admit it to the crimes, all right? So if he's a just judge, he can't let your, your, you know, the things you've done go unpunished. Bottom line is this. We made the law. God, God made the law. We broke the law. Our punishment is dead. Jesus comes in there and he says, you know what? I love Elijah. I love Bryce so much. I'm going to pay their fine. So in turn, he gives up his life. He, was, he lived a life without sin, but he was tempted just like us in every way, but never sinned. He went to that cross and the Bible says while we were yet sinners, Christ died. So he went on that cross in your place. Now, Legally, the wrath of God can't come on you. Why? Because your debt been paid. When God looks down, he says, man, you know, yes, Elijah was guilty, but Jesus Christ paid it all. But Jesus looks at us, and he requires two things for us to seal the deal. Can anybody tell me what the first one is? It starts with an R. We already talked about it. Repent. Repent means what? Turn away from the things we know isn't right. And the second one is to put our trust in Jesus. The thing is this. Putting our trust in him, just like we all of us sat down. We didn't see, look under the bottom of the chair to see if it can carry our weight. We didn't, when we walked in the building, we never asked for the paperwork or the blueprints to get with the architect to see if this thing was structured or sound. We had faith and we believe and we put our trust in the building. Same thing with Jesus Christ. You have to completely put your trust in him. Now, my next question is this, because remember, the kingdom of heaven is where? It's at hand. It, got, it needs to be done as quickly as possible. My brothers, when y'all going to do that? 
Tomorrow not, tomorrow not promise. What about it now, man? Well, not right now, because I'm about to go eat, but I, I'm going to have to holler at y'all in. So this is the thing. You... <laughs> okay, okay. This, this, this is the thing. And they say it right now. Now, at that point, you have an opportunity to lead them in a prayer, right? But you don't have to. Because the thing was, you have already given them the gospel. Let's just say, man, y'all chin and be like, man, Big Phil, not right now, bro, you know. Remember this here, the gospel's already been given. And that message itself, that Jesus died and he paid their sin and, 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 and with his life's blood, that thing has some power. Now, I guarantee you, for the next I don't know how long, that's going to be on the inside of them. So remember, when Jesus went back to Nazareth and we said there's no place like home, I just want you to remember this. When you go home or you're with your family and friends, make sure that you come up with some kind of way to share the gospel message. Now, normally if I'm doing this, I remember one time, guys, oh, thank y'all so much, guys. Y'all give a hand for these saints and these sinners, amen? Mm, appreciate it, sir. Thank you so much. All right. Good job, Liza. Thank y'all. And when we getting out of here, guys, I remember when we, uh, as a church, man, at one point, uh, we was on, the old, on Pine Street, and, man, we used to go out on Simcoe at 9 o'clock on Fridays, right? And we went and shared the gospel. And, man, I remember talking with a brother, and my thing is, I'm going to give it to you really, really quick. It's going to take me really, I, like, I, I done it a little long right here, but really five minutes, and I'm out. I'm not even, I ask you when you're going to do it, okay, that's up to you. He can say right now. I'm like, nah, bro, I got to go to the next person. But this is the thing. We went out there and we gave the gospel. The Bible says Paul planted Apollos water, but it was God that gave the increase. We don't know when we give that gospel message, we don't know if we're planting or we don't know if we're watering. But the thing is that we are being obedient to God. And if you love your family like you say you do, you don't want to allow them to have you don't want to miss, have them miss an opportunity to spend an eternity in heaven. Amen? Guys, I see that's our time is already up. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. You all have already heard the gospel. Um, so this is the thing. If you really feel that you need a Savior, you can go on and pray and repent and ask God to forgive you, and then you can put your trust in him. All right, I'm going to just go and pray a general prayer. Father, we thank you tonight, Father, for just showing us, Lord God, how much you not only love us, but God, how much you love your family, your friends, and your hometown, God. Father, even when they threatened to kill your daddy, you, you still made sure that, that your son went back, God. You, you, loved them, you loved them to death, oh God. Father, I pray right now, Lord God, as we... Uh, ready to leave this place, God. I pray, Lord God, that something will always be in the side of us, God, that we would be able to convey the gospel message, Lord God, because the kingdom of heaven is truly at hand. Father, we know that we're in the last days and time is getting short, God. We could see the wickedness of men and the wickedness is, is waxing and growing uh, great. But God, we don't want to just be believers that's, that's ashamed of you, God. Father, we don't want to be a believers that's, that's hunkering down in the corner where when we get around family and friends, we cut off our relationship with you, God. Father, I pray right now, Lord God, that everyone on the under the sound of my voice, God, that you would burn in them, God, the desire to share your gospel message, Father. God, I pray that you would give them the wisdom, the knowledge, the, the know-how, Lord God, to, 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 to deliver that message with confidence, and Lord God, make sure that it's effective, okay? And Daddy, I pray for every person in this room, God, for every family member that's already heard the gospel. Maybe they gave it to them before, but they just hadn't made the decision to follow you. God, I pray for them now. God, I pray, Lord God, that you would water, Lord God, that seed of the gospel that has been planted, okay? God, I pray now, Lord God, that, that you would uh, have us, Lord God, give us opportunity, Father, to be able to share your gospel, Lord God, with others. Daddy, I ask now, Lord God, if any of my brothers and sisters in here tonight don't know you, God, Daddy, I pray that they would make it right with you tonight. Father, I pray, Lord God, that they would cry out to you with a sincere heart, Lord God, and that they would totally surrender to you. Daddy, thank you for loving us enough, Lord God, to show us that we shouldn't cut people off 
even though they do us wrong, God, that we could be forgiven and loving him, even if we got to love him from a distance. But we should still share the gospel message with him. Father, as we leave, Lord God, I just pray, Lord God, that your angels of protection would be around every person, God. And I pray, Lord God, that every word that was heard tonight, that you would use it in our lives in the not so distant future. Father, thank you. We pray for past and his family, God. I pray that you would keep them, God. I pray for Bible study that's going to be going on in Dallas tomorrow. I mean, uh, in Atlanta tomorrow, in Dallas on Thursday, God. I pray, Lord God, that your message would go out with power and anointing, God. And that lives would truly be changed. Thank you so much, Father, for showing up tonight. Bless us tonight for the rest of the evening. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Thank you all so much, man. Y'all have a great rest of the evening. We'll see you guys on the next go-round.